The best place to learn about product management and growth is from the people who have done it over and over again. I spoke with Megan Murphy, VP of product at Hotjar, to find out how they are growing one of the most successful products in the user research space and how their fully remote team is serving over 700,000 businesses across the world. Megan comes with a wealth of experience in product management, having worked at companies like N26 and Skyscanner. So here is what she's got to share. Welcome to The Product Show, 20-minute interviews with founders and product makers, sharing how they hacked early growth. Hello, Megan. Hi, thanks for having me. Welcome to The Product Show. It's a pleasure to have you here and thank you for agreeing to spend some time with us. Sure. Right, we've got so much to talk about. So let's start with your experience and your journey so far and how did you end up at Hotjar? Sure. So the TLDR of my journey is that I got into product by accident. I'm, it was a very happy accident because in my previous lives, uh, I worked on Wall Street and as a technical project manager. I didn't, I didn't really find my fit in those roles. So um, when I got into product and I was just kind of pushed into it by, a, I was in a 20 person startup and somebody had to go build something and that somebody was me. And I felt like I finally found my fit at that point. I was living in San Francisco, working at a nutrition tech startup back then. And fast forward a couple of years and a couple of countries and a couple of companies later. And my background is largely in B2C um, I kind of cut my teeth at the first sort of product at scale role that I had at Skyscanner, where I grew our car hire and ground transportation team and business um, quite significantly from a team of about three people to over 30 people by the time that I left. Um, I worked at N26 leading, it, leading product. I was the first head of product there for monetization and finance products. Um, but I, I found myself at Hotjar a year ago because it was the first time where I ever felt like I really needed to go somewhere that aligned with my values and the way that I want to work and the kind of leader that I always wanted to be, but I never really had to follow. And so, yeah, I've been there for a year and I, in the VP of product role at Hotjar, I lead our product design and data teams. So we're a remote native company and we have 700,000 businesses using Hotjar across most of the globe. And our team is in 30 countries. So it's been a, it's been a crazy year. My first week was actually the first week of lockdown when I joined the company. So it was a hell of a time to get started in a new role, but it's been, it's been really cool so far to see like a best in class remote culture and then trying to bring a, a complete transformation to the product in, itself is, has been really fun so far. Yeah, that sounds like an amazing journey so far. I mean, let's talk a little bit more about um, Hotjar and you mentioned values. Can you give us an example of what exactly you mean uh, here, especially when it comes to product growth and management? Sure. So I think, at least in my experience, most companies that talked about leading with their values, it was limited to posters on the walls and, you know, public image and like PR. <laughs> um, at Hotjar, we, we take it really seriously. So for example, uh, we have five core values and every person at Hotjar can name those five core values off the top of their head. Um, the reason for this is because it comes out in the work that we do every day and we're all held accountable for those values. So every person at Hotjar, when we go through our performance reviews, which are twice per year, um, we're actually rated in terms of how much we live our core values. So one of our values is building trust with transparency. So in a performance review cycle, um, your colleagues will be asked to give examples of instances in which you did or didn't um, build trust with your colleagues, with your customers, with your team um, through transparency and, and you know, being direct. Um, another one of our, our core values is to be bold and move fast. And so when we're in everyday meetings, no matter what the context, if it's, should we launch this? Should we release this? Should we do this interview? Should we, customer interview, I mean, should we, um, you know, anytime we're confronted with a decision, it, you hear people say, what's the bolder option? How can we move quickly? So I think like seeing a culture where people just recognize that the way that they lead needs to be consistent with our values is a very special thing. And going through the interview process at Hotjar, um, candidates are also held to this standard. 
So we'll evaluate candidates on whether or not they're a good fit for Hotjar based on did they obsess over their users? Were, did they build trust with transparency? Were they bold? Um, did they you know, learn by doing, which means they're not afraid to make mistakes. So I think that just this culture, if you really, really take it seriously, it comes out in how you interview, how you recruit, how you decide to hire, how you pr approach performance reviews, how you make decisions every day. And no matter how many posters are on a proverbial wall, there's nothing that replaces um, recruiting people who really wanna live by those values in the first place. What do you think are the most important qualities of a good product manager? And what are you looking for when you're hiring product managers for your team? I would say that one of the most important qualities is someone who is um, decisive, but not arrogant about their decisiveness. So I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to work with anybody, <laughs> product managers or whatever their role is, who are decisive to a fault of not allowing new information to change their decisions, right? So I want somebody who has conviction and confidence in making decisions, but who isn't afraid to change course and say, oh, I didn't know that before. And now this changes things. Let me reconsider okay, yes, I agree with you. Let's, let's change direction. So with product managers, I look for um, humble decisiveness as, as first thing. And a second thing, there's so much modern discourse in the product community these days about the, the need to have like simultaneous discovery and delivery. And I completely um, hold myself to that standard. And I agree with that. I think the best product managers are ones to recognize that they really need to balance both of those. So you need to stay with your eyes ahead of the curve and looking at where the ball is rolling, where's the market going, what are customers expecting and, and anticipating. So you need to discover that, but you don't need to like, you, you can't let it sit there, right? You can't discover and discover and discover and do nothing and let your findings sit in a corner and collect dust. You need to act on them. And that means delivering. So I think that taking this seriously and recognizing that there's a balance is very important because product managers who don't deliver are just strategists and product managers who only deliver and don't discover new things, I guess, optimize stuff and manage projects. So I'm really looking for people who can live both of those and who don't see it as a the two in competition, but they just see like, that's the gig. The gig is to find problems and solve them, rinse and repeat and rinse and repeat over and over again. Right, yeah, very interesting. I think um, one of the biggest things really, especially in user research is, okay, you can spend the weeks or even months learning about your users, but what do you do with the information after that, right? And um, how do you actually use it to improve the product? And it's down to, as you said, the personal qualities, but sometimes it's about the process and how the company has organized uh, um, how it operates internally. Can you tell me a bit more about how the product team at Hotjar is structured and uh, how do you operate? Sure. So within product at Hotjar, um, we're organized like a, a number of modern tech companies in this tribes and squads model, um, which popularized by Spotify years ago and which I saw at Skyscanner when I worked there as well. So at Hotjar, underneath the um, broader umbrella of products, you have experience design, which is a, a number of design disciplines, including user research. Um, you have product management, and then you have our data disciplines as well. So data engineering, um, data analysts, and soon to be some data scientists as well. Um, in terms of the vertical and horizontal mix, so we have a number of tribes, and I'm, I'm pretty open about this. I think org structures are something that product leaders should talk more about because it's hard everywhere and it's constantly evolving. So at Hotjar, we've got a tribe, for example, called Grow and Monetize. And in that tribe sit a number of squads that help us grow our business and monetize our product. So you'll find there, for example, a pricing and packaging team. You'll find um, an acquisition team you'll find a payments team, right? So how do we generate revenue and capture that revenue and grow our customer base in partnership, of course, with our marketing and sales team? Um, each squad is more or less made up of um, two or two or three front-end engineers, two or three back-end engineers, and then uh, a team lead, which is uh, what most companies call tech lead. We call it team lead at Hajar and a product designer and a product manager. So it's a pretty good... Uh, representation of a number of disciplines. We have other um, roles, as I mentioned, within product, which include research and our data disciplines that are not embedded within the squads per se, but they, they support uh, a number of squads each. So um, 
I think in more mature companies, I've seen this embedded model where you have your data analysts, data scientists, your growth folks, your marketing folks, et cetera, all aligned in, in every single squad. Um, I think it's just a matter of scale. At Hotjar, we're a team today of 150 people. And so that kind of um, setup is a bit beyond our own size right now. But I certainly see the day where that is a reality at Hotjar. Amazing stuff. Yeah, Hotjar is certainly a product that helps other products understand their users better and improve the user experience. So I believe we all can learn a little bit from what you guys are doing there. So can you tell me how you're using user personas, for example, and um, is your approach to personas different to what is you know uh, standard for the market? Sure. So. The way that we're using personas at Hotjar is um, largely a reflection of two things. What I've seen elsewhere that I, th that I thought worked and didn't work, and also the contributions of a number of folks on our team. So we're actually going through a change right now where we're, where we're shedding what we used to, the style of personas that we used to have, and we're moving toward a new model. And that work encompasses folks from brand, from marketing, from product, from uh, research. So the the transformation of our personas is a multifaceted um, initiative together because all of us use personas differently, right? So the way that a sales team would benefit from having strong personas is different from someone in support, which is different from someone in design. So what I saw in other companies um, are, are basically two polar opposites. In one place, I saw uh, personas based on really, really quantitative profiles of usage. And so it was talking about frequency of doing some action, um, intensity of using specific features. It was talking, it was very, very quantitative and it had no emotional story, no, no nothing. In the next place, I saw the complete opposite end of the spectrum where there was basically no behavioral data or um, ethnographic data. Um, it was just like a story and a, a, a pictures. And so what I'm trying to do at Hotjar is encourage our team together to create personas that are useful for all of our work on a daily basis to make better quality decisions faster. That's the whole point. So right now, what we're changing from in the past is we had a number of personas that were basically a one-to-one -one match with a job title. So in the previous years at Hotjar, there was a persona called digital marketer. There was another one called product manager. What we're doing now is actually looking at what, you know, let's level up from jobs to be done and think about what different roles have in common according to what they need to do. So for example, one of our new personas may be something like, the, I say maybe because they're not set in stone yet, but it might be something like um, the storyteller. It doesn't matter if it's a product manager, a product marketer, an analyst, a researcher, whatever. What matters is that the, the needs of that persona at that moment are to tell a story and synthesize presumably a bunch of inputs into a couple of outputs that make sense to go get them outcomes, right? Tell a, tell a narrative that lands. And so we're framing our personas less around job titles and more around the storyteller, the investigator. Maybe the investigator is an analyst or a researcher. It doesn't matter if they come from the quant or qual end of the spectrum. They're the ones digging in and trying to understand things further. So this approach, I'm, I'm very optimistic, will help be a good balance between what I saw in other places where there was like over-indexing on either quantitative or qualitative. And I'm, like I said, I'm most helpful that the personas really bring our customers and their needs to life in a way that can be actioned every single day by a number of different disciplines within Hotjar. I like that you mentioned the jobs to be done theory. We are a huge fans of it here at Pony. We use it you know, when uh, building products for our clients. Can you give me um, a couple of other examples perhaps of how else you're using it uh, at Hotjar? Sure. So, I mean, I, when I think about jobs to be done, one thing that really matters to me is that we don't think of jobs so specifically that we pursue local sub optimizations in every part of the product. So at Hotjar, we have a recordings product and we have a surveys product, for example, among others. And I think that it's important to consider what does somebody want to see? What does one of our users want to see when they're watching a recording? Okay, they want to see if somebody gets angry and frustrated and rage clicks. They want to see um, where someone successfully finishes something in the flow, like they check out or whatever it might be. Um, 
Separately, if they're looking at a survey, one of our users wants to see, did somebody complete a survey? How did they feel about this? Which questions um, really spoke to them? And so, but if we focus so, so specifically on the job of the survey and the job of the recording, then we actually miss the big picture, which is how was this person's experience with our product and what did they have to say about it? And so I think it's important with jobs to be done to, not, to, to, to recognize your altitude. When you fly low, you have to care about in the moment, in the context. But when you zoom out at a higher altitude, you have to recognize that ultimately the job to be done, no matter your business or your customer, is to make your customer a hero, right? That's it. That you want them to be a hero in whatever it is that they want to do or pursue. And so I think for us, um, using that framework, like when a user wants to make a survey or analyze the responses of a survey and when they want to watch a recording and extract some insights from a recording, we just have to make sure we don't lose sight of it because the, the buck doesn't stop there. You have to zoom out and say, how does somebody want to understand what's going on in their product and then see what people say about it? And how can we make this one very smooth, connected experience to make it super easy to parse? Um, so that's, I'm, I'm not saying we, we are the, are the best example of this today, but I can, I can promise we will be soon. <laughs> can you give me an example of a small, uh, UX improvement or a product tweak that you've done at Hotjar or probably some of the other companies that you've worked before that you had a disproportionately high impact, uh, on, on the product, something small, uh, that turned into a big win. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll share one recently from, from Hotjar. So we recently launched a, a Slack integration. It was toward the end of last year. And um, in the Slack integration, so I'll speak as a customer. This is like how I speak every day. So as a Hotjar user, um, I use Hotjar and I also use Slack within my company. And whenever I receive, uh, whenever my company collects some feedback from our users, we want to see it and not let it go and listen to, right? Because the voice of the customer matters so much. So actually what we did at Hotjar was we launched an integration with Slack such that anytime a customer leaves feedback or uh, you have a new recording come in, um, you can receive this in a Slack channel set up for this, or you can choose where they're rooted to in your Slack channels. And the results of this have been pretty astonishing so far. I, I wouldn't say that this is a, an improvement per se. It's just a really small, like lateral move into, into some new space. And thinking about what are the use cases of our customers, right? What are their jobs to be done? Their job to be done is to listen to the voice of the customer, make sure that they can hear it and then take action. And so this um, Slack integration, we've seen a really, really healthy uplift in retention, in the frequency of use and the number of users per account that are added because when some folks see, hey, this user just left you feedback, that's a really nice loop for us to attract new users within the same account. So I would say that's one good example specifically about the experience in terms of an improvement, my mind goes to something that I, I worked on at Skyscanner, which was um, when you're traveling um, and you, you would choose your travel dates, we noticed that a lot of, uh, a lot of travelers base, this is pre-COVID by the way, I know this sounds like ancient history, but um, a lot of travelers once upon a time used to, um, used to like choose their travel dates based on public holidays. Right. So you say, oh, OK, there's a three day weekend. But if I take off two days of work, I can go away for five days. Right. And so what we did was we used to we used an API from a holiday, like a public holidays calendar and open source um, uh, API out there. And we built that into our product such that as a user based in the UK, when I go to choose dates, it showed me on the calendar which dates were public holidays. That way I wouldn't have to go Google when are the August bank holidays this year, right? And so we did this for, I think it was like the top 10 um, markets by volume of, of flight search for, uh, for Skyscanner. And we saw some really, really nice results there. And this is something that I built while I was there. And it, we actually went on to build on top of this further and further in some marketing campaigns in um, some nice landing pages. So, um, so just a small tweak of like, show on a Friday that this is a holiday and you'll get people to say, oh, okay, that this is more realistic. I don't have to jump from my Skyscanner tab to go look up the holiday schedule and then come back because you know that anytime somebody leave your product to go somewhere else to do research, the chance that they actually return to finish the job to be done sinks, right? So this was a, this had an outsized impact. Yeah, it's very interesting, isn't it? That sometimes the best product improvements 
come from quite a lot of research and tests and sometimes it's purely by accident or just you know trying something you're discovering whoa i would never imagine that uh, this would have this you know huge impact um this goes back to the topic uh, you know that i'm really passionate about is um how do we build a culture of experimentation and how do we make sure that people free to go and explore and break things and learn from their mistakes without being accused of, you know, not delivering towards the business objective or um, wasting their time, perhaps. Do you think this is like a luxury for bigger companies or is this something that uh, younger companies can adopt? And, you know, what's your experience with that? Positive and negative. Sure. Yeah. So I think that in my experience, typically the bigger the company, the more there is a trap of optimization instead of innovation. There's very few that can really balance this well, right? I mean, um, I think Netflix is a great example. I use that just to just to set the tone of what I'm saying. So instead of just thinking about DVDs and then streaming content, now they're thinking about content production, right? And so I love that they recognize that what they're up against is not per, not exclusively other streaming services. They're up against a bottle of wine and sleep. <laughs> and I think that if you really, really continue asking why, 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 why your product matters. And you can recognize what your competition is, which is really just like how other people spend their time, not necessarily the, the next best thing in the market. Um, this is the attitude that I like to take at, at, in my work. So in terms of like giving people the freedom to experiment and to learn and to adapt and to fail, I fully believe in this. However, I think that the you know, a lot of companies assume that what's good for Google or any of the Feng uh, tech companies is good for them, right? So we see this play out in job descriptions. People just rip off job descriptions from big tech companies without thinking critically about is there bias baked into the way that this, the requirements are written. The same thing happens with experimentation. A lot of smaller companies think that they need to experiment because that's what the best in class tech companies are doing. But what they don't recognize is that there is, there is a, time consumption and brain space consumption baked into A-B tests or multivariate tests. And I fully support, and I mean, I've had some really nice wins with experimentation in my experience as an individual contributor. So it feels great when you say this X percent jump is the, is the consequence of our work together. That's very powerful, but it's not always needed because what's needed is confidence to take a decision. And how do you get confidence to take a decision? you have the answers that people are gonna expect you to answer. And how are you gonna have those? You have to assess your risk. And so actually, I think that in terms of the way that we approach innovation and optimization comes down to your risk appetite. Is the risk, if we wanna launch a new feature, is the risk of this feature, the customer value, will they get value from it? Okay, great. Is the risk about usability, okay, there's high risk because it's hard to use, but the value is high. So that means that's, a, that's an opportunity to, in a, um, to experiment and to iterate on the experience because we know they get value from it. Now let's reduce the risk that usability sacrifices that value, right? So I think that if you look at things through or look at opportunities, whether they're innovation or um, optimization through a risk lens, then you can better understand when to flex your muscles on A-B tests and quantitative experiments and when customer validation through qualitative discovery will suffice. Because I don't think one size fits all. This is how the greats are managed to continue innovating. They know when to optimize because they've captured attention in the market on something. They've proven out the value, the business viability. They've proven out that the experience works. Whereas you have to also take some swings on something new in order to stay relevant. And that's where you can't really A-B test your way to innovation. So you have to have a safe space to fail. Um, I think that leadership sets the tone for, for failure being an accepted part of the culture. Ideally, you just don't make the same mistakes. You're only making new ones. Right. Yeah. Very interesting. And I agree with the point, you know, that sometimes even with uh, when it comes to UX and design, I mean, sometimes you'd have people with expectations that then, you know, you need to spend probably months on discovering something that's already been discovered. And there are like best usability principles that you can follow and build to them rather than, you know, start and, uh, you know, try to uh, discover everything from scratch. Can you give me a uh, maybe uh, an example or what's your view on what are the red flags uh, that you know show that a product is heading for trouble? 
Sure. So I think one of the most important indicators is um, customer feedback hitting a certain inflection point. So when it, when people get value from your product, the feedback that they give you, um, let's say, woohoo, we love this, right? That's the positive stuff. If it's not a screaming, I love you, it's more, it's, it's about giving them more. So, hey, have you ever thought of an integration with blah, blah, blah? Have you ever thought about making it easier to da, da, da? This is so great. It would be even better if you would blah, blah, blah. If, if your feedback from customers sounds like this, I think that's a, that's a very healthy indicator. But if you hit this inflection point where that becomes less uh, prevalent than this is broken, this doesn't work, this looks old, this is behind, I'm switching to another product, um, this is too expensive for the value that I'm getting now. If, the, if that feedback is coming not from the majority of your customers, but the majority of the customers you want to serve, this is dangerous. This is, a, this is a point that the people you seek to serve and whose problems you think you're solving, if there's more of the complaints rather than the requests, this is a very clear indicator that you're off kilter and that you've really got to change. So I think that that, uh, th that mm, balance is very important to me. That's a really important indicator. And so at Hotjar, like our tools are inherently about bringing voice in the, of the customer to your ears, right? So every other Wednesday, I have lunch with the product and design team. I have an open invitation to whoever wants to join. And in that uh, lunch discussion, because Hotjar is generous enough to give us like a work together budget that we can use remotely so we can all order lunch together, for example. And so we sit there, we order our lunch, and then we read through customer feedback from the previous two weeks and we start with the angriest. <laughs> And then we have a mirror board where we track the whole journey. So every, every single piece of feedback that comes in from a customer, we build our own user journey based on the feedback that comes in, which is mostly like we start with the most negative because the positive feedback, we're grateful. We love our customers. We're so happy that they're, that they're happy, but we know that that's not the area to improve. Just like in a performance review, you know, you're like happy and you feel fulfilled and gratified. Um, with the positive feedback, but it's really the negative feedback that shows you where to go, right? So it's the same thing with a product as it is with a personal development. It's like, what are people telling you they want more of? Uh, what are they telling you you're not, you're not meeting their expectations? And then how can you keep track of this and take action and not just let it accumulate over time? Right. Okay. So as a VP of a product and such a successful company and with your previous experience, you have obviously achieved a lot in product management. Can you um, tell us, who do you learn from? How do you make sure that you keep on top of things and you kind of always can uh, deliver the best results for your team and the companies you work for? Sure. So I am... Uh... I'm not shy about talking the, about the support system that I have built or that I actively build. So I have two mentors who I pursued. Well, yeah, I pursued that kind of relationship. And I said, hey, uh, when I worked with you, I really valued that you did X, Y, and Z. And usually the people that I look up to are the ones who make hard decisions. Um, I just think that's like inherent in leadership. If a leader can't make a hard decision, then I don't know what they're leading. Like, so I'm attracted to leaders who can make hard decisions with grace and who can help people understand and bring them along for their journey. And so I have two mentors. Um, I'm really lucky that both of them are, are CEOs of pretty big companies. And so I just have like a million things to learn from them. And I'm humbled that they would even work with me, <laughs> honestly. Um, I also have a coach that I work with, um, which is on my, my own management style. I recently went through storytelling coaching as well. I had a storytelling coach from a really cool startup called Plot Wolf. Um, they coached our whole product team in terms of how to tell great stories and how to like build the structure of a story and make a story with beats and with a punchline. So, and yeah, and, I, and then in my personal life, I have a therapist. So I, I'm growing from the the advice and the guidance and sometimes just someone who listens and makes me feel heard and makes me feel expressed and not judged, whether it's my personal and professional life. There's so many people I look up to. And I just, I think it took me a while to get comfortable raising my hand and saying, I have no idea what I'm doing. It looks like you do. Are you willing to, to show me the way? Right. And then I can, I, I can form my own opinions based on if I think that somebody's approach feels natural for me. Cause I also don't want to 
in, in, the, in the midst of like working with so many people that I admire, I don't want to lose myself either. So I need to make sure that I stay true to who I am, that I use the language that feels natural to me because I'm not trying to become anybody else. I'm just trying to take what I think others, it's working for them and then learn how to give my own style to it. Right. Yeah, as everything, not just product management, really, like constant self-improvement and a certain level of humility, perhaps, uh, is what we all need. Gone are the times when we can just sit on our diplomas and uh, what we used to know 10 years yeah. ago. Right, yeah. that's been amazing, uh, Megan. Thank you so much. And before I let you go, just one more question. What's the one product metric that keeps you up at night now? What is something that you're really obsessed about uh, right now? Um, let's see. Probably, prob it would probably be adoption of the new stuff. So the new stuff that we're shipping, the new things that we're making, how many of our brand new customers, like in a given customer cohort, the people who joined us in April or March or whatever, um, how many of them are adopting the new stuff? How good are we at showing the value and making it so clear that what you came to Hotjar for a couple of years ago Yes, it's still there. Yes, it's still valuable for you. But oh, by the way, we're innovating. We're making new things and here they are. So I'm looking at like, are people, are people finding valuable what we believe solves their problem? So it's, it's about adoption metrics right now. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure to have this chat with you. I wish you all the best at Hot Jar and with everything else you, you start after that. Thank you very much. The Product Show is brought to you by Pony, a design studio helping startups and scale-ups build and optimize their digital products at speed. Check pony.studio to learn more.